yeah um okay so now now we're now we're at the roger moore films which again is is kind of the ones i remember the most from my childhood just mm -hmm. because they seem to be the ones being shown on tv or we had a video or whatever um i always used to say that i roger moore was my favorite bond as as a, as a child again just because i think the films started being a lot more fun at this point some would yeah. say camp sure. um um and maybe they went too far with, with that um live and let die um again an, an interesting concept and an interesting baddie i don't know if it was handled as well as it, it could have been but um mm -hmm. Yeah, what was your thoughts on, on I, that? I like that they, you know, tried to give Bond a new flavor and tone. You know, it really from the get-go feels like a 70s film. I mean, they go to New York, but it's like gritty. Yeah. And it has a little bit more of an edge to it. Um, and I, I like the weird kind of like fantasy touch angle, like the, not like the card aspect of it and like mm. the light amount of voodoo. Like it's like it goes a little, you know, not to be like stereotypical of it stuff, but like I do like the, the idea of it. I like the idea of allure and mystery in movies and just the fact that like there's a fate somehow laid into the plot of the movie with the cards and with their destiny, which I, I do appreciate when that's done in film. So um, I do like that. And I, and I think Roger Moore is a, is a good James Bond. I think he warms up the first couple films and I think he really gets into his stride mm -hmm. later on. But I think it, the, the franchise needed a fresh take. And I think they did the right decision, making it very different too. It, again, with the gritty realism, the New York and the New Orleans and not quite being as uh, outlandish. I mean, at the end, they do blow up Katango with a, <laughs> like a balloon. So, I mean, it's, it is outlandish. Yeah, it was uh, with a I mean, shot. Yeah. Uh, as shot. a kid, this is one of the ones I saw on TV at like 11 or 12. And I love, I mean, just, for, I never forgot like the alligator scene, just is something that's always stuck with me. Yep. Like, I just think that's a classic Bond scene, like a henchman, he's got a hook for an arm. Yeah, and yeah. He's the, 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 the thing. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, and that's, oh, I forgot. They actually, that's another first, it's the first time they kind of do the uh, From Russia With Love thing, like the end of that movie. Like he's on the, the train with the hook at the end mm. and they fight there as well. So um, yeah, no, I mean, I'm a fan of Live and Let Die. I think Live and Let Die is an improvement over um, quite a few of the Sean Con I mean, I have a whole list, which I'm sure we can go over later mm. where, I, where I rank them out. But, okay, uh, sure, we, we can talk about, I mean, again, it's, it's, got, it's got an impressive song as well. You know? Oh, I mean, um, come on, maybe the most famous song in, yeah. like, outside of being in the film. Yeah, a a absolutely. Um, and again, yeah, it, it was of its time. You could argue that the producers were trying to um, jump on the whole kind of black exploitation type 100%. Uh, phenomenon that was going on, certainly in the US. Um, but again, they were just trying to m make something that would be commercial. But yeah, I think I think it does it does stand on its own. It does kind of it is a Bond film, you know. It, it doesn't kind of go off piece too much. Yeah. Um, no, I, yeah, I, I remember liking it, and again, it has all the elements of you know, it's got alligators and it's got the go with the hand. Um, yeah. Um, I love the soundtrack too. Again, I mean, I'm just to talk about John Barry again. It's like it's just there's this like mystery <coughs> hint to it. There's this track like Bond meets Solitaire, and it's like one of my favorite musical pieces from Bond that I always keep replaying and it's just there's something about it's like it's super spy but it also has a sense of fantasy to it and but a 70s feel it's just amazing how the, the soundtracks have really evolved through it like I consider talk an hour about each soundtrack and go through each track like I also listen to sure. the soundtrack of like every Bond film after and like really listen to each of them and like played them all in the car so I like really feel like you understand like once you hear the music you like feel the soul of the film a little bit more well see that that's the other thing isn't it that we can keep coming back to sort of met one of the many elements of what makes Bond so successful. It's, it's, is the soundtrack, you know, the, the, the soundtrack yeah. to the film is so important. I mean, you could say that what well, soundtracks would be all big budget films are important. And of course they are. And you've got films like Jaws, obviously, which is, has a very unique soundtrack, but there's something about both because Bond has that signature, music piece yeah. but it's it's they also have the song and now it's it's each bond has a bond mm -hmm. song to that particular film but you're right it's also it's, its own theme so there's just so many different yeah. levels yeah so which again is like if you compare it to the other 
massive films like Marvel doesn't have a Marvel theme song. No. You know? it, it doesn't have a sort of thing, oh, it, here's, here's a Marvel tune, and they put, you know, it, it doesn't have that, even though They there's... got that little music cue they started adding in the front of the movie, but, like, they've already, they changed it, like, three times. They keep changing it in Marvel. Yeah. They don't, they're not consistent with it. Um, but that's yeah. also, just in general, I think Bond works, you know, it's, like, it's same but different. And that, that's like the beauty of it. And that's like, then that's what kind of the audience want, right? That's what we kind of all want. We want the same, but different. And they kind of deliver that constantly. And up until the Daniel Craig, again, they work so well. They're individual films. You can watch them completely out of order for the most part. I mean, you yeah. can kind of just turn on one and turn on the other and, and, and totally enjoy it. Yeah. I mean, I think the best sequels and franchises do that. Something like Harry Potter even does that. Where like, she, you know, the books are written so well and the movies are made in a certain way that like, yes, it helps to watch them all in a row, but like you can just watch Harry Potter three and just watch Harry Potter five. And you can completely understand the story and get it as an yeah. individual film, you know, just like any Bond movie. Mm. I mean, and that's possibly one of the criticisms of the Daniel Craig ones from sort of Skyfall, Spectre and yeah. No Time to Die a little bit is because you kind of, like, it is a bit of a continuation. There's this theme yeah. running there where you're right. It's, it's, a lot of the other bonds is you could watch it completely mixed up. You could watch Live and Let Die and Goldfinger and um, View to a Kill. And you're, you're not thinking, oh, hold on, like, where is he? And why is yeah. he looking like that? It's like, you're right. Um, after that, again, one probably one of my more favorite ones, which I don't think it did very well at the box office, uh, The Man with the Golden Gun. Yeah, that was like the lowest um, grossing at the time. Yeah. Which, again, he kind of is... It's odd because it kind of it Man with kind of the golden gun. Again, it, it it's got a really catchy song. Yeah, it yeah. kind of ticks what should have been along boxes. Exotic locations. I think the the villain is pretty good. You know, it's mm -hmm. um, Christopher Lee is is playing it. Um, you know, he's I mean, got three his nipples. Own... What's not? I mean, geez, can you look at that? I mean, that's a iconic. Yeah, exactly. You know, he's got a golden gun. I mean, that's pretty fucking cool. Yeah. Um, do you know what I mean? Like, like I yeah. like that the plot's not fully world domination. Like, it's kind of like this guy yeah. wants to challenge Bond. It's like that lower scale fun of it actually feels refreshing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's not, they're not all in volcanoes trying to like hold the world to ran ransom. He's just, he just likes guns and he wants yeah. to like shoot James Bond. He's not in a volcano. He's just in a, a secret apartment on this cool rock formation in the middle of. Uh, so it's yeah, he's still just Atlanta. chilling out, doing just, his own just, thing. <laughs> just um, on his yeah. private plane there, but just a little yeah. bit less outlandish, right? Like, <laughs> that's all you need. Yeah, it's it's like it's like making a film of like Bill Gates or just Be Bezos. Now he's just yeah. he's just chilling out on his island, and you know why why are these um, government agencies like messing with him? You know. Um, Again, yeah, it's they so also have sorry, they have that the boat. I love like that's the scene where they're like they go to I love how in all these movies they, the office of like <laughs> MI6 always moves. They go to this like yeah. abandoned boat, like half sunk in the sea, and it's like the whole set's like on yeah. like diagonal, and they're just like, Hello, Bond. It's <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like like they go to all that effort to like in a sunken <laughs> boat. It's like, why not just rent the the, the office block on, on the big <laughs> but but it looks great, doesn't it? Because it just, yeah, it's it, fun. It's memorable. I mean, we're talking about it now because yeah. of that. And that's the thing was the, the kid aspect too. It's how you get it. There's that that cheekiness that's kind of, uh, you know, makes you smile. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Because, because there's no other films that do that. You know, the Rambo doesn't yeah. do that. Um, no. <laughs> like Commando doesn't do that. The Terminator doesn't do that. Do you know what I mean? Like, like, like Ghostbusters don't. Do you know what I mean? It's like this yeah it, it's just fun and so it's almost like you kind of you have to you have to do that if you make yeah. a bond film um so i i like the man with the golden gun but yeah it didn't didn't do very well and perhaps they were a bit worried um mm -hmm. at that at the time i don't know some people have criticized it years later saying oh again they were jumping on the kind of kung fu craze now because sure, there's an element of that um, and I, I don't know if they were because it's only a small element of it. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's part of making movies, though. You want to bring in what's popular yeah. at the time. And, and I think that's what keeps Bond fresh again. And again, if they were all just spy movies, they're not fun. To me, it's fun to be like, oh, this is, yeah. sounds terrible. But this is the one that's kind of a kung fu movie. This is the one that's kind yeah. of a yeah. space movie. This is the one that's kind of a black exploitation movie. This is the one that's yeah. kind of a you know, an, a Russian espionage thriller. This is the one that's kind of like an 80s action movie. Like, it's fun mm. to have these different um, kind of hints to sure. them, especially when you're getting like, 
whenever you start getting the sequel 11 or 12 or 13 in a franchise, I mean, let's be real. You got to do something. Do you know, I, I think I think that's for me anyway, why I've got no interest in the Fast and Furious films. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen that maybe the first three, I first saw the first one in the cinema, I was like, yeah, okay. Then the second one, and then, I, yeah, I, I don't know how many they're up to now. I haven't seen them, I don't care. Nine plus a spinoff, they keep going. Chug a chug chug. But they're all the same. They're all, they're all, I mean, I know one was Tokyo Drift, and maybe they went to London, one other, but it's all, all the same people that, and they all seem to be doing the same thing. And just like, I'm bored. Like, I don't care. Like, whatever. You know, like, nine's too yeah. many of them. But, but you're right. All the Bond ones, at least. Nine's too many. Let's talk about Bond 25. Let's yeah. keep going. Yeah, exactly. So, um, the ne next one, which again, I think is arguably my favorite, it's, I'm not sure if it's um, Goldfinger or this one. It's The Spy Who Loved Me. Um, Fantastic. Yeah, amazing, amazing film. Uh, for, for this, I mean, there's lots, lots of things to yeah. talk about. This, you know, whether it's the 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 set lighting and DOP was done by uh, Stanley Kubrick with the you know the the, um, mm -hmm. the submarine scenes. Yeah, the third act. Um, I mean, that alone is 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 crazy, isn't it? Yeah. Um, What's crazy, yeah. too, I just want to add, is like the last movie didn't do well. And, it, and that's, yeah. and watching the making of all of them, this one had a three year gap, which at the time was the biggest. And, and the broccoli, he just went like, you know what? We're going to go big. Usually they only went big after they made a lot of money. But this was a time where his, yeah. he, maybe his biggest risk he talks about because the last two films, first one was a hit, but you know, wasn't as big as the Connery's. And mm -hmm. the next one didn't do well at all. And then he just was like, no, we're going to double down and we're going to make the biggest and best James Bond movie. And then it was a massive hit and you yeah. know, he made the right call. So uh, that's kind of proof, if you like, as in like, yeah, if, if, if you've made a film and you make a sequel and it doesn't do well, double the budget. <laughs> you know, <laughs> throw more money at it. And, just do and it. Then, yeah, you'll just um, come out the other side. I mean, one of my favorite Bond girls, I think probably the, the most developed and the most memorable as, as in the Bond girls. Um, but she had her own identity and she was you know, a Russian agent. So the the... Arguably the best Bond car, you know. The I know. Lotus, yeah. I know that Aston Martin is kind of everyone's favorite now, but come on, it's it's uh, a Lotus that turns into a submarine. <laughs> I mean, that's pretty fucking cool. It's pretty great. And it's um, again only in James Bond. So I love about like, and what other movie you're gonna watch for the car is, and also that chase is so epic when he's driving on the hillside and the helicopter comes up and they're like side yeah. by side and it's a real helicopter. You're like, wow. And then that turns into like, then he dives in the water. Like, there's nothing else you can watch where you're gonna believably be like, wow, that that car turned into a a submarine. And you know what? I'm gonna buy it. And it completely works. <laughs> and that's why James Bond is James Bond, and that's why you gotta love it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. If that was Mission Possible, you'd be like, what? No, no way. That's yeah, not, the tone that's doesn't, doesn't work. Yeah. yeah or if, if they did that in the, you know, Daniel, the Daniel Craig one, they did, it was easy. They did the plane to the submarine and it, some, and it worked too. You know, I'm going to say that, mm. that was, that was good. Yeah. 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 I like the um, outlandish things. Again, Jaws, one of the baddies in it. It's the um, introduction yeah. of Jaws, which obviously comes back. Maybe as my favorite henchman. I'm trying to think it's, you know, it's him or, right. I mean, Odd Job and him are like the two best. So. Yeah. And again, I'm going to agree with you. Like, I think that this and this is the best of the Roger Moores. And I think this and Goldfinger, I debate in my head too. Like, I think they're pretty yeah. much equal. The only thing Goldfinger has for me is like the villain of Goldfinger is better. Like he has a better plan. It's a more clear vision. It's a little smarter yeah. and he's a better, he gives a better, more Bond performance. Um, sure. But Spy Who Loved Me has better action. And but, but I mean, yeah, they, they, to... they're all over the place. They're in Egypt. They're all over Europe. Oh. The you, Egypt I mean, stuff is so good. I mean, just the structure of that movie. It's like one of the, again, the Bondism, like perfect pre-title where it's like you end with the classic stunt with the I mean, opening of the Union that, Jack. Is that what you guys call it? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Great. That 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 is that is still the uh, quintessential quintessential. I can't even speak. I'm not even sure that's a word. That that is the Bond open. That that's a standard. I think every other Bond has tried to be up until that. Yeah, yeah. exactly. It's like when it's and again that most. Most big budget action films, that would be the final scene, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. Of of that that scene, the, the amount of money they would have to yeah. spend on that. But with Bond, it's the opening scene. You know, the That's opening. my thing about Bond. The opening scene is always the best scene in the movie. The biggest scene kind of yeah. which, it yeah. gets you so excited. 
it's like you're being chased on skis. You you ski off a mountain and you're free falling. And this is yeah, pre-CGI. So this is like someone doing that. Yeah. And then the I mean this this is filmmaking 101, isn't it? it it's yeah. like the parachute opens up and the Bond theme hits at the same yeah. time. And of course, it's the Union Jack, the uni British flag. And it's like, da 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 da. And it's like, now you know, you know what you're in for. You know? Yeah. There's no mistake. This, this isn't any other film. Um, so, yeah. And I just so, want to say the Egypt stuff is for me like my favorite. I think it, there's such a, with the, it does well, like that perfect blend of like suspense, mystery, but also action. And that idea of traveling to new locations, like just the way it's lit, like when they're having the, the scene in the, the pyramids and the yeah. lighting, it's like scary and it's like, I mean, horror. And even the, so later yeah. when they're having, when they're running through the pillars and they're having that like pillar fight with Jaws and they can't find yeah. it's like, it's also great. And even when he fights that other henchman in the like, uh, the top of the rooftop of houses and stuff. Like, I mean, my favorite stuff in any James Bond movie, maybe that some of that first act stuff where he's in Egypt. Mm. I think, in many ways, if again, it, it's so hard to pick between them because if anyone is new to James Bond, if and you know, there are people that have never seen James Bond, yeah, if you had to say, okay, the first James Bond to see, I don't know if I would tell him to go and see Goldfinger or The Spy Who Loved Me. I, it would be such a such a, a difficult choice because you're right. It's like the, that particular film it tells you everything you need to know about what is a good James Bond and what James Bond is about. You know, it's a, mm -hmm. it's a fun thing with the spectacular uh, and everything else. Um, and again, I, I think, I think it, it, it worked, you know, it got them making um, money. And again, which is another sort of theme there, obviously filmmaking moves along and uh, evolves. And in between that, then sort of Star Wars was, this, sure. this thing, obviously, that they follow it with Moonraker. And again, you could say, oh, Moonraker is an attempt to cash in on the kind of Star Wars. It is. I mean, 100%. They don't deny that. Like, I mean, yeah. But again, I, di I did I did have um, uh, a conversation with a friend of mine. He was saying he'd watched Moonraker re fairly recently. And he was just, he, he was just like, what is going on? You know, like, like yeah he looks so shoddy and like these effects and the bit with the um the uh the the cars you know the um what's what's it called um the oh the venice cable thing? cars oh the cable cars yeah 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 okay um he was just saying that that, that whole scene doesn't make any sense as in because they climb out of you know they yeah. get stranded and, and bond says we got to climb out of there because we'll be safer on top which yeah okay doesn't really make any sense <laughs> but um the film overall i think you know as a as a kid i remember liking it because again it changed pace it was bond okay maybe only at the end but he's kind of in space now and i remember i used to know uh, a guy who was from sri lanka Mm -hmm. um, only a few years older than me, and his memory of of that particular film was that came out in um, the cinema when he was a kid in Sri Lanka, and it was a big deal. And like all the kids went to see it because again, it was just it was a fun sort of thing. Yeah. And again, it's the taste of internationalism, as in like anyone can kind of get this, you know? Yeah. No matter what country, from what what language you speak um yeah. it's, it's a big deal so yeah um what, what do you how do you um, like uh, Moonraker? i just gotta say it i love moonraker i don't understand how people say it's bad i think moonraker is great also anytime says moonraker is outlandish i genuinely question them i genuinely don't know what they mean because i'm like so but they always say the spy who loved me is great and i'm like you mean the movie where the guy wants to have people live underwater like i think in 2021 we can all agree like I think the odds of us living, I mean, I don't think it's going to happen soon, but the odds of us living in a space station are a little higher than living us on the bottom of the ocean. <laughs> yeah, that's very so, true. You know, I actually don't think Moonrake, I mean, literally we've had giant volcanoes. We've had like sharks. I mean, we've done the most craziest things in these first 13 bomb movies that people are now like, oh my goodness, I can't believe he's going to space. Like, yeah, he's going to space. I, listen, Bond shoots a laser gun. I'm sold. <laughs> I love Moonraker. Um, 
you know, it's the same director as The Spy Who Loved Me. He comes yeah. back. And I think, the, again, the quality of the filmmaking, I think, is fairly equal to Spy Who Loved Me. Now, it's not quite mm -hmm. as good overall. It's a little bit longer. And I think the people don't like the pace is a little slower in Moonraker at times. But, you know, and I guess it is the key, it is the outlandish thing. They kind of do the, you know, every, every, every so Bond has their one where they go maybe a little too far. Mm. Um, but personally, I, I, I really do enjoy it. I, I think it's um, a lot of fun. Um, I mean, all the I, I love the villain. I think the villain is great. You know, he's basically like an evil Elon Musk type of uh character yeah. i think he's actually one of the best von villains just the way he talks and the way his voice i mean i think he might be the best villain since uh um you know blofeld i mean really i mean at that point like at the like none of the bond villains for me in the, the his films the roger moore ones really stuck out in that classic bond way because mm -hmm. even though like the plot of the spy who loved me is that i don't think the actor has the cadence of, of the right but that that right like european accent to um his when he, and he's playing the piano and he, Mr. Bond, it's just so great. And to do, me, do you know who? Huh? Do you know who rem he reminds me of though? Who? He reminds me of George Lucas. Oh, he does. Yeah, he totally he does, does kind look, of look like, like him, doesn't he? And yeah. you kind you kind of wonder if that was part of the because the <laughs> space connection. You wonder yeah. if that was. I didn't uh, think about that. And I just um, I don't know the whole stuff with the the centripetal force thing i love that when he gets in the thing and he's got to I mean, that's going, brilliant he's got to use that i mean that's classic yeah. bond he's got to enjoy how's he going to get out of it it's like oh yeah he's got the, the wrist thing and yeah, he uses yeah the, the wrist the... thing um i don't know i think it's a lot of fun and then even, even for me like personally my favorite thing is like jungles and temples like i'm obsessed with like mm. pure adventure movies like you know indiana jones pirates mummy that type of stuff so like just going to the Amazon, like, there's a boat chase in the Amazon. That's cool. Like, I'm sorry. That's really cool. Like I, like, I want to have a boat chase in the Amazon. And then like Drax's sure. layer, that's the name, Drax. Drax's layer yeah. is awesome. Like it, like he walks in, it's like, whoa, this is like a jungle. And there's like a Python, but then it's like, oh no, there's like Egyptian architect. And then it's like, no, it's space futuristic. Like, and also this is the last film, I believe. This is why I think the series actually takes a dip after this, like, after this John Glenn directs the next five for a little bit. And mm. Um, Ken Adams, and we haven't talked about it. Ken Adams is the production designer of the Bond films, and he leaves after this movie. And he is the guy who has that. that quint when you look, sometimes look at something and it screams, like, you know what franchise that's from? You know, like when you see a Bond, like, you know, that, that big 60s room, you just think that feels Bondy. And it has these only Bond feels that way. And it, that continues all the way to Moonraker with those angular shapes. Mm -hmm and the way the space station is designed, and of course, the spy who loved me, and the volcano, and everything that's come before. Even if you go back to Dr. No, that simple room with the tarantula, it's just that one little circle over. It's like, it yeah. all feels pure Bond, and that's Ken Adams, and he steps away after Moonraker, and I think the films visually take a big hit, and that's why I don't think I like the last three Roger Moore movies as much, as mm. he's not only is he getting older, and the movies fit more of that 80s template, but they lose that that ar architectural flair, I think what people, like for the 80s in general, you know, what people thought was modern doesn't, it didn't age the same way. That like the yeah. 60s and 70s looks cool and interesting. And then like yeah. the 80s are like, no, this is modern and everything just feels like small and cheap. Which yeah, and tacky. You know, and, yeah, yeah. And tacky, yeah. which was some of the, like the villain layers in the next three movies just don't look that that good. Yeah, in any way I mean, for your, yeah, for your eyes only, um, again, I, yeah, I kind of remember this the least. Mm -hmm. um, it yeah, it was kind of for your eyes only. See, I should have done that for everyone. I should have like you should have said the name. Yeah. And I should have sung the song because I know the song to each of well, them. We kind of we we could do that, and I could edit it in. That would be funny. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. Um, yeah, for your eyes only. Um, I don't remember hating it when I was younger, but I haven't seen it for a long time. Mm -hmm. which kind of says something i guess perhaps um yeah what what's your what's your thoughts on um yeah basically what i said basically uh, you know the moon after moonraker they did the the thing they've done a few times where it's like back to basics bond um but the mm -hmm. problem is for me in the back to basics is it loses that panache it kind of has uh that style comes it kind of really feels like an 80s movie the music feel, i like the music the music it, and I, again another thing i guess talking about it, like spy who loved me has disco bomb music it's fantastic it does doesn't it like yeah. it's yeah. pretty it's like awesome and then now you're starting to get like 80s like kind of like and each one's like a different for this like early 80s it's like half rock half techno that's right yeah it's kind and of like heat lock keyboard sort of yeah, yeah. kind I'm of like the, the the um kind of what's it called the electro wave type yes. 
now, you know? That's yeah. what I was looking for. It has that music. And but right. I, I do enjoy the first, I think the first act is good. Um, I, I like the, the car chase is actually really good. The car chase in the beginning on like the hillside, they're on like a little yellow car. It's like one of the first reasons that joke where it's like Bond always drives a nice car and he walks out and it's like, he has to drive this like mini Cooper, like little that's Italian right. car. Yep. Yep. Um, and that's probably the best scene in the movie. And then each act gets a little long in the tooth for me. And at the end, he's got to climb the face of the rock wall. And it's funny, like, Bond went to space and dust up, but something about seeing him like climb a three thousand foot rock, we just like, yeah, yeah, you know, listen. In space, he's not climbing. You know, he's in. A, he has this. He just yeah. has to sit in something and get up there. And he's James Bond. And you get out situations, but to see him physically labor that much was a little, a little much. But again, it's just for me. It's also one of just the boringest Bond movies. Now, some people like it, but I'm more, personally more of a fan of big outlandish Bond than I am toned down Bond of the. Film. Yes, I'm c- certainly when it comes to Ro- Roger Moore. Moore That's what I mean. Yeah, I guess um, sure. And obviously that was followed by Octopussy. The Again, best titled Bond movie. I was going to say, it's... Yeah, you could say it's the best title. I mean, it's the one that's been... That's a half joke, I mean. <laughs> yeah, it, it, is, it is a cheap joke, but it's the one that's been um, used many times in, you know... Yeah. No, it's not... I don't know how good of a title. It's one of those things that's like, eh. I feel like... What was the... Oh, they should, I think it should have been called Property of a Lady because that's what the name of, like, the thing they're always after. But... Mm-hmm. Um, it is funny because like there was a time where I watched it recently and I was like with friends and I was like, gotta go home and watch Octopussy. And like, there's like a five second, like, what? You know, like, <laughs> yeah, what and I'm like, the James, James Bond, 13, Octopussy. And they're like, oh, okay. Like, <laughs> so like, yeah, the title hasn't aged well at all in that way. Um, no, but, it Although ironically, if you're going to wear, if you're going to wear any Bond influenced t-shirt, that would be the one you'd wear. Yes, I, think. Exa- I mean, 100%, um, you got to be on the in joke. It's one. Of, it's like a kid when you're like wearing a shirt that like doesn't say a bad word, but it looks like a bad word, and you're like, you can't get me in trouble. Like it has that attitude yeah. to it. Um, but I do like this movie. Like again, the travelogue aspect. Like my favorite thing about it is I love going to India. Like yeah. India is great. Like um, yeah. just seeing even okay. I don't know what those little those things are called, but those little like bike cart things that uh, like the, people sit the, on. The, the, and talk yeah, about. yeah. If there's a chase on one of those, and I absolutely That's right. love it. Like they yeah. have a di- like, first of all, just sitting on the back of that car and driving through India and having dialogue scene to me is like pure James Bond because like only James Bond like gets in another country, you have cool establishing shots, he gets there, mm-hmm. and it's like there's yeah. a dude waiting for him, and he just hops on this little car and he's driving through town. It's somewhere you've never seen. It's cool, and you feel the the authenticness of it because they actually went there. And yeah, I don't know. It just feels great. And there's a chase on it, and it's it's fun. There's like a little castle he's got to go to. That's where he's got the little alligator. He's got to pop up and. Yeah, I do like yeah. the villain a lot. Um, I forget his name, but he's great. And they have that little bet where they're playing backgammon. That's one of my favorite scenes. And he like yep. wins the egg over. Um, so no, I do like Octopussy. I like it more than um, For Your Eyes Only. And I like it more than A View to Kill. But it's not as good as the other Roger yeah. Moores, but you know, still, yeah. still enjoyable. It's like a lower mid-tier bond, I feel. So. I, again, and I think, um, yeah, Roger Moore was getting a little bit over the hill for it now. And I think that that's visually very much uh, apparent in A View to, View to a Kill, which yeah. is obviously his last one. But um, I think, yeah, at, at the time it was kind of noted, wasn't it? That as in, he's now what, like 54, 55, something like that. Yeah, and 54, and, 55 looks a lot different then than it does now. I mean, you're, you're right, yeah, because Tom Cruise is so. not. Um, that and doesn't look like that. But, Daniel Craig is in his fifties. You know, he looks I mean, great. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, the, the you know the idea that he's um, Bond is the, yeah looking like Roger uh, Roger, uh, Roger Moore then, but like Grandpa he's, Bond, yeah, Grandpa <laughs> Bond, but like he's um, yeah seducing like uh, nineteen twenty year old women. Um, yeah, it's starting to get a little much. I, again, I mean. As a, as a villain goes, I don't think it's the best villain, but yet it's uh, Christopher Walken, you know? Um, oh, yeah, View to Kill. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, you know, it's it was interesting. I think I think maybe they were running out of ideas a little bit. But, mm-hmm. um, I, I, yeah, I remember it being being quite, quite, quite a fun one. I remember it more than, say, yeah, like, Few Eyes Only. Um, mm-hmm. It... Yeah, it's almost. I would say it. It feels at the time, although I was I was very young at the time. But looking back at it, I think it's that's perhaps when people started looking back at Bond. 
going right okay now it's been around for quite, quite a long time yeah and is it time for a change sort of thing yeah. you know and i think they think they picked picked up on on the fact that it probably was um because the next one was obviously a different bond but a different tone yeah. but yeah um for your, that was, uh, that's my thoughts on the movie. I mean, I feel the exact same. It, it feels like that. Like when you just watch it, it, it's not like it's terrible, but it's. I think it's probably one of my least favorite Bond movies, and it's because it just it just feels like one too many. You know, sometimes you just you just go around the you just go around too many times. You know, and it just you, you feel yeah. like they should have retired the year before. It feels like like it's just like we've seen this gag, we've seen this joke. The formula is really at play. It's the seventh mm-hmm. Roger Moore film, and they just got they got nothing else new to give. And you know. Yeah. It just feels like uh, we're just now we're just making these to make these. It really does feel like that start to there for sure. sure. 